Let's see now how our body regulates sodium and regulate potassium. Of course, sodium is the major ion in the extracellular fluid. We talked about this. And if you remember, even from AB1, when we talked about the resting membrane potential, we said like we have minus inside, positive outside. We will have the sodium outside and the cells will prefer sodium always to stay outside and potassium always to stay inside so the sodium is the most important ion outside the cells now this those sodium ions or the concentration of sodium either it can go high or it can go low in case of low it will be hyponatremia okay that is lower concentration and if in case of high it will be hypernatremia and now both conditions in the hypo it means we we have too much water one of the reasons it might be that we have too much water okay accumulated in the body and therefore we will have less concentration of sodium hyper it means that for some reason we are you know secreting plenty of water and therefore there is high levels of the sodium this would be like maybe adh problem or ald aldosterone problem so those are hyponatremia and hypernatremia now on the opposite side we will have the potassium potassium is the one the most important one inside the cells and again we will have either hypokalemia or hyperkalemia hypo when we have low potassium ions hyper more potassium ions now the problem with the sodium and potassium both ions whether they are inside or outside are important in in neurons and in muscles because they will control the resting membrane potential they will have control over the resting membrane potential and this is very well balanced process if you remember right so we have we need to maintain this ratio of sodium and potassium to maintain the ratio of the positive and negative that inside is always negative and outside is always positive any changes in the concentration of those two ions it means we have changes in the values of the membrane potential see for example if i have higher sodium concentrations okay so it means i will have higher positivity outside so the difference now between inside out uh, and outside will get bigger so instead of minus 70 maybe it will move to minus 90 right because I increase the number of the positive values inside what about if I have less sodium and instead of three for example I get one then I will have here less negativity the difference will will it drop and the same thing for the potassium if I have more potassium here the same thing I will I will get uh, less negativity inside and so on so those changes in the sodium and potassium will cause the changes in the uh, resting membrane potential and therefore will cause changes in the uh, responses of those muscles and neurons so either i will get easier action potential or i will not get action potential at all it will be difficult for example for the muscles to get stimulated to contract it will be difficult for the neurons for example to get uh, stimulated to release their action potential and this of course will affect the entire body think of the heart for example if the heart cannot get depolarized right or the skeletal muscles like the diaphragm cannot get depolarized or it will remain depolarized it cannot get hyperpolarized or depolarized right so that all would come with consequences sometimes it will cause confusion sometimes it will cause uh involuntary contractions and sometimes it would develop into a very serious issues for those patients and the treatment are extremely difficult treatments are not easy especially for the sodium the hyponatremia and the hypernatremia if you go and search you can search it like how to treat hypernatremia and hyponatremia and you will see there is a complex management for uh, for those cases that there are several scenarios that the, ba the doctors or the nurses they have to be aware of if the patient is doing so and so and so then yes or no then they have to do another analysis yes or no and so on so those are like again complicated issues in the body now in general for us at this stage what we need to understand how the body maintains the homeostasis of those of the sodium and the potassium of course this is something we already talked about that mainly through aldosterone and aldosterone if you remember this is one of the cortical hormones this is from the adrenal cortex in the group of the mineral corticoids and there we have have the aldosterone so in case we have low blood sodium levels or high blood potassium levels so here the potassium and sodium will go against each other the sodium and potassium will go against each other so in both cases we will have aldosterone released from the adrenal cortex aldosterone will target the dct the distal convoluted tubule and it will 
basket to reabsorb sodium and to release potassium so let potassium go to the to the urine let potassium go to the urine and therefore this will should should normalize sodium potassium levels so aldosterone will target the kidney will ask the kidney tubules to reabsorb sodium and let potassium go and this would uh, restore the levels of the sodium and potassium usually for the sodium the sodium we can reabsorb it sodium reabsorption is okay potassium reabsorption at the dct is rarely to happen maybe it will never happen if we need potassium we will absorb it from the proximal convoluted tubule but that reabsorption is not controlled by the hormones here we are talking about the hormones there is no hormone that would cause reabsorption of potassium now another hormone that would affect sodium is dangiotensin 2 which is the major hormone to regulate the low blood pressure and this is something we already talked about but we will we will do some drawing again for it as a refresher let's start again with the sodium and potassium through aldosterone the regulation of sodium and potassium through aldosterone so in case we have low sodium or we have high potassium in the extracellular fluid this will cause for both of them release of aldosterone will target the kidney tubules and uh, dct specifically will ask reabsorb sodium okay and release potassium and therefore restore sodium potassium uh, balance now for the angiotensin if you remember for the angiotensin mechanism this is part of low blood pressure response right if you remember this is the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism so here we have the kidneys start with the kidneys they sense low blood pressure therefore they will release renin we have the liver the other hand releasing angiotensinogen we said the angiotensinogen is the inactive form so when renin meet with angio angiotensinogen it will convert it to angio it will convert it to angiotensin one there is then there is another enzyme that will convert it to angiotensin 2 and this is the active form then angiotensin 2 will do three things target adh causing vasoconstriction and releasing aldosterone adh to release or to block your information okay so adh we know we already talked about this target kidney tubules or the collecting tubules target uh, collecting tubules and dct and also we already talked about that display aquaborins to reabsorb water right then the second one will be aldosterone it will target the kidney tubules it will target the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone which will also target the dct ask it to what reabsorb sodium and take it back to the blood right also will cause the vasoconstriction vasoconstriction to increase or uh, reduce lumen right and therefore increase the blood pressure so collectively all of those would cause increase in blood volume and therefore blood pressure but what we are understanding trying to understand here is the aldosterone relationship with the sodium and with the angiotensin and renin so this axis okay this axis with aldosterone has influence over the sodium ion. but again this is a mechanism of uh, restoring the low blood pressure uh, to restore blood pressure okay or to increase the blood pressure then we have the regulation of calcium and this is something also we already talked about that we have calcium homeostasis this is for the calcium balance and if you remember we have two hormones calistonin and bth so in case we have this is the calcium levels if you remember we said we need calcium because it's important for the functions of the heart we saw it for the function of skeletal muscles and also for the function of the neurons so in case we have high levels of calcium high calcium levels thyroid gland would release calistonin thyroid calistonin calistonin will do several things activate osteoblast if you remember those cells would make bone inhibit osteoclast those cells will break bone and they for release calcium also as kidneys and small intestine don't absorb calcium collectively this will drop calcium levels this will drop calcium levels so that's the calistonin however the most important mechanism for calcium levels is the pth so in case we have lower pth uh, in case we have lower calcium levels this will be sensed by the parathyroid or uh, parathyroid gland which will release the parathyroid hormone right and the parathyroid hormone will 
do always the will will do the opposite of the calisthenic. So we will have several actions four or five. First one, of course, activate osteoclast. So this is to absorb bone, right? Inhibit osteoblast. So no more bone formation. So we don't need bone formation. So we don't consume calcium. Okay. Target the kidney. Absorb calcium or reabsorb calcium. Okay. Where is in the kidney? Again, in the DCT. It talks to the small intestine. Also reabsorb or absorb calcium. Also, it will talk to the kidney to release vitamin D or to activate vitamin D, which will talk to the small intestine and help in reabsorbing calcium. But at least, you know, the major steps are the osteoclast, osteoblast, the kidneys and small intestine. And collectively, this would restore calcium levels. Okay, this will restore calcium levels. So that's it for the calcium and that's it for all of those ions. I'll stop here in the following video. We will talk about the acid-base balance.